Um, so I was asked to talk today about a very practical example of how we're implementing One Health here in Georgia. So I'm gonna talk about um, our new rabies surveillance system that was developed um, starting in 2010. And we're gonna start just by talking about the history of how reporting was done prior to that and what some of the issues were, you know, why we wanted to create a new and better system. Um, how we developed that, how we started to roll that out across the state and actually began implementing that here in Georgia. Um, we'll then take a look at the surveillance system itself. I have some screenshots and I'll point out a few key points. Um, and then look very briefly at some of the data we're able to now collect um, and then talk about the future plans for the system. Um, so as has been mentioned, human and animal rabies has been nationally notifiable since 1944, I think Jesse actually said 1938, but this was on CDC's website. <laughs> um, so those are nationally notifiable. Animal bites are not, but those are reportable here in Georgia. And you've seen this poster before. Both of those are listed as immediately reportable diseases. So there's a wide, wide variety of how these reports are actually made. Um, back in, you can see the date on this card was 1996. Um, I think these dated back to the 80s, maybe even before then. Um, but these are actually two separate cards um, for general reportable diseases. So, you know, a health department or whoever, a hospital, um, could send these cards into epidemiology to report a disease. So the top one you can see is actually for a dog. The first name is canine. <laughs> So that's actually for a dog that is suspected of having rabies. And the bottom one here is for uh, a human that was bitten. Um, so again, this is general notifiable disease, not specific to rabies, so it collects very, very little information. Um, then we started moving into a little, a little better forms here. This, I think, is from sometime in this century. <laughs> um, again, a very general form for reporting a notifiable disease, not specific to rabies at all, so we're not able to collect much information about the incident or the animal or anything of that nature. Uh, we also have these rabies interview forms that were created. Um, I think one has a date of 98 and one has a date of 2000. Um, so here we are starting to look specifically at rabies. We have a little bit more information. Um, you can see there's a little chart where you can mark where someone was bitten and whether the animal showed signs of rabies. Oops. Um, so you have this. This was also tailored for specific hospitals. They decided that they wanted to create their own. This one is very similar, but tailored for Tift Regional. Um, so again, you're starting to see some of the variety of all of these things that could come in in different ways, different information. Nothing was really standardized. Um, Julie mentioned that we work with the Georgia Poison Center. They field thousands of calls for us related to animal bites and rabies, and we certainly appreciate their services and their assistance with that. Um, but so they send us a copy of their call log for each of those calls. So that comes to me at the state office and then gets distributed through the district to the local level. It takes many days. This has been coming by fax. So, um, and then, of course, there are always the phone calls that come in and the emails that come in. So all of these different ways that we can hear about it, this can come to epidemiology, environmental health, animal control, to hospitals, to the poison center. This can come at the state level or the local level. And there is really no good central way of keeping track of all of this. Um, if it came through epidemiology, either at a state or district level, we typically enter that into SENS, which is our statewide electronic notifiable disease surveillance system. So this is what we use for all of our reportable diseases. And because it's epidemiology, it's very patient-centered. It's entered on the person. Um, so in addition to general demographics, um, we would collect a very tiny bit of information related to the animal owner. Um, and then, again, very limited information about how the patient was treated. Um, and what happened with the animal, the animal disposition. Was it quarantined, was it tested, et cetera. If this came through the environmental health side, they enter it into Garrison, which is their own system, completely separate, and because it's environmental health, it's very animal-centric. So they collected very little information on the patient and what, how the patient was treated 
Um, and again, these systems did not talk to one another at all. So often the, the numbers didn't match up. You know, we have really good data in terms of rabies testing. Um, we didn't really have as good of a data for everything else. Um, and if you're an epidemiologist or a researcher, you know that if your data isn't that great, it's really not that useful. You know, it it's, can be dangerous to use that to make prevention or control recommendations when you're not actually seeing a complete picture of what's happening. Um, so some of the more serious limitations of the data, again, as I mentioned, there was no centralized system to report this. So we really had no idea about the true number of animal bites that occurred across the state. Again, we've got really, or we had really good data and continue to have good data in terms of testing and animals that test positive. But for all of those other animal bite cases and incidents, we really had no idea. We couldn't tell you whether there were 2,000 people bit in a year or 20,000 people bit in a year. Um, inconsistent data elements were being reported. Again, lots of different forms coming through lots of different mechanisms. There was very little that was standardized about wh what we were collecting. Um, the disease listing in SINs, so that screenshot that I showed you, it wasn't tailored to animal bites or to rabies. So again, we're not collecting some of the really important information that we need. Um, because we're working in different departments or different agencies, we often saw sort of silos of data and of communication. Um, as Julie pointed out, Georgia is a home rule state. Each county does what it does. At, at the state level, we have really very little say in that. Um, and so some, some agencies communicated better than others, as you can expect. Um, epidemiology and environmental health are two of the disciplines that are very involved in rabies and animal bites. Um, some counties did really well at communicating and sharing that data, and others didn't even know who their counterpart was. Um, and with all of this, there's the potential for delays in collecting this information or following up on an incident and miscommunication. And as we know, rabies is fatal, and we don't want there to be any potential for delays um, and a missed case that we really could have stopped or we could have prevented a human death. Um, and then finally, all of those uh, mechanisms of reporting only recorded the initial incident. It did not tie into any of the follow-up at all. So we didn't know what happened with the person, really. Did they follow up with post-exposure prophylaxis? Did they complete the series? What happened to the animal? Did it die? Was it tested? You know, we have our <coughs> test results in one place and this information in another place. None of it tied together. So <laughs> there are some pretty big issues, as you can see. So back in 2010, um, myself and then um, my counterpart in environmental health, we both independently approached our SINS team um, to discuss building a new tool that would help us to fix some of those issues. Um, and I've listed a few of them here, and I know we're running behind, so I'm gonna try to breeze through this a little quickly. Um, we wanted to improve communication among all of those organizations. Um, we wanted to reduce the time that it took between reporting an animal bite and initi initiating an investigation, and then, of course, the time to having some resolution for what should happen. Again, with all of the faxes that came through, it often took several days for it to reach the appropriate person, and by that time, if it were a stray animal, that animal was long gone, and there was practically zero chance of catching it and being able to observe it or even to test it. Um, we would be able to have, uh, be able to gather data in a systematic way that allows for relevant and useful analysis of trends in animal bites. As Sherry mentioned earlier, you know, epidemiology really does drive all of our prevention and control recommendations, and if we don't have good data, we don't have as good of recommendations as we could potentially have. Uh, improved documentation of confinement and animal disposition, PEP recommendations and other treatment decisions, and then of course increased collaboration between epi and environmental health where we have mutual interest and responsibility. Um, so as we started to think about how we wanted to build this, we had a lot of questions. You know, Who are the potential users of the system and what is their role in this whole process. You know, we have epidemiology and environmental health that are part of public health um, and, and follow up on these cases in different ways. We have the reporters, so we've got hospitals and other physicians, veterinarians, et cetera, who may be reporting these cases to us. Um, they don't necessarily need to see the same information. Um, if you think about HIPAA regulations, they 
of course, don't need to see all of the follow-up, but they need to be able to report it. So we had to think about what the different roles were and sort of who fit into those categories and how to give them access into the system. Um, what data should we collect? Should it be required or optional? We really had to balance um, our need to collect information um, to, to make these recommendations uh, with, you know, are people actually going to do this? If you require too much and ask too much, no one's going to want to do it. They're going to get unhappy and say, this takes way too long and I hate this. So we really had to try to balance those two pieces. Um, how can we standardize reporting while still maintaining flexibility for the various jurisdictions? So again, we wanted some standard elements. We wanted some basic information to be consistent among reports, but because each county handles things differently, we wanted to still allow for that flexibility and not necessarily change their practices, but just provide a tool to document those practices. Um, how do we integrate data from other systems? Our public health laboratory that does our testing, you know, that's electronic, right? Isn't there some way that we can get that information to automatically feed here and link up to incidents as they occur? The same with the Poison Center. We get those faxes of all of their calls. Is there a way that we can have that electronically feed into the system? So it really is one tool for all aspects of rabies management. Um, how does this benefit the user? You know, again, if local staff don't see any benefit of this, they're not going to want to do it. They're not going to want to change what they've been doing, even if that change or what they've been doing is really ineffective or inefficient. Right? Some people don't like change. So we had to make sure that it was something that would be useful to them at a local level in addition to at the state level. And then how do we fund this? You know, we, of course, everyone needs money, so um, we wanted to train people in person and travel around the state. So we had to think about how we could get some money to be able to do that. So, um, like I said, in 2010, we really started the development internally, thinking about all these questions and trying to create the system. Um, in January of 2011, we felt like we had a pretty good start um, as far as we could get without getting some major input from um, local jurisdictions. So we began a pilot project in District 8-2, which is the Albany District, so that area. Um, and they used the system. Um, we actually went and did training with them. They started using the system for about four months. Uh, we made quite a number of changes based on their feedback. Um, and then in April, we felt and they felt that we had gotten to a good place and worked out most of the kinks and were ready to, to go live with the system. So that district actually started um, officially using this in April of 2011. So over the next couple of months, we developed a timeline for rolling this out across the state. Um, and our next district um, to go live was District 7, which is the Columbus area. Um, and they started in October of 2011. And then over the next year plus a few months, we completed training in the remaining 16 health districts. So by the end of 2012, we had completed training in all 18 health districts. Um, it was um, myself and Tim Callahan from Environmental Health went and met with the potential users, had computers in the room, it was a very hands-on training, um, and I'll show you some, some results from that too. But so in January 2013, in the beginning of this year, is when we went live across the state. All the districts are now using this. So 2013 is sort of our baseline year. Um, and I don't have the district lines on here, but you can sort of see. Um, so the, the lighter colors are the earlier start dates. So Albany is down here. They started in October 2011. And then you can see as it gets darker, it's more recent start dates. Um, so these, you know, Savannah and Waycross started late 2012. Um, but so we sort of phased it across, across the state. Um, as I mentioned, it was hands-on computer-based training with identified users. Um, we reached out to our EPI and environmental health contacts in the districts. Um, again, we can't really force this on anyone because it's all, you know, counties do what they do. <laughs> um, so we asked nicely for them to play with us and everyone was very cooperative and responsive. Um, so we started with EPI and environmental health. We encouraged them to invite their partners 
from that district, and it varied. As Julie mentioned, animal control is present in some of our counties, but not others. Um, sheriff's offices or other law enforcement agencies sometimes play a role in animal disposition. Um, hospitals and healthcare facilities, veterinarians, uh, everyone that we would, would think of. So we invited all of these users to come to the training. And some of the common questions that we got were things like, whose responsibility is it to do this? Or, you know, we have been doing this way, do we still need to do that? And some people didn't really like our answer, but <laughs> we said, that's really up to you. Again, we wanted to maintain some of that flexibility. You know, whose responsibility is it to do this? Well, who had been traditionally doing that? Again, we didn't want to change their practices. We wanted to create a tool that would enhance those and improve the documentation. Um, so we, over this year, trained over 330 local and district staff, which is a pretty astounding number. Um, we did a semi-formal evaluation of the training itself. Um, we had 210 responses. And it was pretty basic, just a five-point scale, either on um, you know, strongly agree to strongly disagree or always to never sort of scale. And you can see from the numbers that we had really good response. So it seems initially that people were excited about this, felt that the training was appropriate, that the system you know, could be a good thing. Um, so again, briefly, I just want to look at this. And I'm going to point out a few important things as we go along, just to give you a little better idea about what we're talking about when we're, we're doing this. So um, on the left-hand side here is a search bar where you can search by basically anything that you would possibly want to look for. You know, if you know the victim's name or you want to find out, you know, all of the dogs in a specific area that have been involved in something, you can search by that. Um, and then on the right-hand side is sort of the, the screen that you're working with. So we start out with the bite information. So, you know, what happened? Where did it happen? Who was involved? You know, how many animals? How many people? The basic stuff. And this is generally what we had been able to collect beforehand. Um, as we go through here, you'll see that the darker red spaces, or pink, I guess, are required fields. So in order to actually save this, you have to enter this information. And again, this is that difficult balance between what do we want to require and what is too much that people are going to get angry at us about. <laughs> Um, so once we enter this general information, um, then there's the, the opportunity to, to enter a lot of other things. So this is actually from the human record screen. Um, so at the top of this, which is cut off, is general demographics, you know, the patient's name, address, race, age, etc. cetera. Um, and then we get to some of the interesting things that we've never been able to collect before. Um, so for example, we have, you know, exposure details. Was it a bite, a scratch? non-bite exposure, did it end up not really being an exposure? Maybe it was reported and then as we follow through with this investigation, we realize, well, no, actually there, there was no true exposure here. Um, and then we can collect this um, prophylaxis and treatment details here. Um, this is something that could be extremely useful in so many ways. So was prophylaxis recommended? And we've got a couple options, so your yes or no. Um, we found that some counties would refer people to their physician to make that decision. We found that some would refer them to the poison center to make that decision. Um, so we ask, th and these are required fields, these three here. So we have to know with each human that's involved in an incident, was prophylaxis recommended and then who recommended it? And so, as Julie mentioned, you know, these recommendations can come from all of these variety of agencies, and we really have no idea which ones they're coming from right now. So, as we collect this data, we'll start to see trends and be able to better target our education to make sure that we're giving appropriate recommendations, to make sure that we're not, you know, recommending people receive PEP when a test comes back negative or when an animal can be quarantined instead. Um, and making the best of our, the most of our resources. Um, and then the other fields down here are optional. Oops, sorry. Um, so we can start to track and find out, are people following through when we recommend prophylaxis? Um, again, these are optional fields, so it won't be collected in every case, but I'm not aware of any sort of information 
um, across the U.S. On, on whether people actually follow through with prophylaxis or not. So it'll be really interesting to start to collect this and hopefully be able to inform us not only here in Georgia, but across the U.S. Um, there's also a, a section for animal records. Um, so you can indicate whether the animal was the attacker or the victim or both in some cases. Um, you know, if it's pet or livestock, there's additional information that will show up about vaccine status and veterinary and owner information. Um, with those animals, we can, can find them. Um, so you would select an animal here from one of those that you'd entered and put some information about where you're actually confining it so we can follow up on that. Um, there's also lab testing information. So again, if you select the animal that is being submitted for testing, um, all this information was previously collected, but the reason for testing. So was it a, a human exposure or a domestic animal? What are we sending? Where are we sending it to? Um, you can actually print out the lab submission form directly from this. Um, previously, people were having to handwrite on those triplicate things that smear everywhere and you can't read the third page. Um, so now everything can be printed from the system. And then the laboratory results will actually populate here. Um, so we get a specimen number and the results. And this view lab, you can actually click that and show a, a paper report um, of that and print that out if so desired. Um, and then I think this is our last glance. Um, again, we wanted to make sure that this would benefit the users. So we um, created a summary report, which is really just basic information. Um, but with just a couple clicks, one can easily find out either for the entire state or for a specific district or specific county um, how, many, how many incidents have occurred. So this is from statewide from October 11th through November 8th of this year. There were 824 incidents reported across the state. You can see the volume that we're, <laughs> we're talking about. And this is, I should have mentioned before, um, this does record both animal to human exposures as well as animal to animal exposures. Um, and you can see that uh, 357 of those cases have been completed that had a human exposure. 30 of those were recommended prophylaxis. You know, we tested with all these a total of 167 in the past month, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can look at, you know, how many animals are we confining and what type, whether they're vaccinated or not, um, whether they die, et cetera. So at a really quick glance, we can get some important information here. We also have dynamic reports, which allows the user to pull any field. We can manipulate that data and compare, cross-tabulate, and find out anything you would ever want to know. If you want to know how many Chihuahuas bit children under the age of five in Fulton County, you can pull that information. Um, so just a couple other things I wanted to make sure to mention. Um, we were able to incorporate that electronic feed. I pointed out the laboratory section where that information will auto-populate. Um, Poison Center, we have access to their system now as well. So those cases actually immediately feed into here um, so you could do away with all of the faxes. Um, users will get a notification email each time an incident is created so that they know, hey, you need to go in here and look. For epidemiology, you know, we're in the system every day, so it's not a big deal. But for our, our environmental health partners or other partners that don't use this, we wanted to make sure that they didn't forget that they needed to go and check on this. So they actually get a notification each time a new incident occurs. Um, we did implement some validation rules within the system to ensure data quality. Um, and then I mentioned the required fields as well. Um, so again, just very briefly, I pulled a couple, um, uh, a little bit of data. So, so far this year, there have been over 9,300 total incidents reported. Uh, 7,880, or about 85% of those, have been closed, meaning the investigation is complete. You know, there's no animal under quarantine or isolation. We're not waiting for a lab test, et cetera. Um, so of those that are closed, 91% of them had human exposure. 6% were animal-to-animal exposures, and then 3% were duplicate records. 
um, which people are able to close out without really having to fill out much of that information, or any of that information. Um, there were about 6,700 pets or livestock involved in these incidents. 39% um, of those were currently vaccinated, 31% we weren't sure about. Either you know people couldn't prove it, or maybe it was a stray animal that previously had a home and doesn't any longer. You know, a variety of situations, and then 30% did not have vaccinations or had an expired vaccination. So we can see we've got some work to do in Georgia to make sure that um, owners are staying up to date with their their pets' vaccinations, and this is for the whole state. So we can actually pull this for each district or each county and see if there are specific counties that have a high portion of animals that are not vaccinated. Um, so this, I, I again, just pulled some pretty basic things. We tested almost 1,700 animals for rabies so far this year. 208 of those were positive. Um, we've confined 5,200 or so animals. 5,100 of those were 10-day quarantine, so very few 45-day observations or longer. Most of those are 10 days. And then we have destroyed a little over 1,800 animals, so euthanized for testing accounts for a lot of those, or perhaps owners don't want the animals anymore. Um, of the 7,100 closed incidents with human exposure, 9% resulted in PEP. Um, and about what is that, 70 of those were due to s direct lab testing results. So you can see that 600 of those received or were recommended to receive post-exposure prophylaxis, but not based on testing. So maybe it was a stray animal that wasn't available, so we recommend, recommended uh, prophylaxis. Um, and then the average number of days to close an incident to complete an investigation is eight days, which is pretty good. If you think about all of the 10-day quarantines, obviously that's going to take at least 10 days, right? So um, we're doing pretty well with being able to, to complete an investigation. Um, and some other things that I didn't pull but that we'll be able to answer now, you know, are victims more likely to report certain types of incidents to a particular agency? Again, this can help us tailor our education and our messages to those agencies and to the general public. Um, who's giving recommendations for PEP to the victim? Is it, you know, physicians, public health employees, et cetera? How often do they follow through when it's recommended? Um, one of the big questions that always comes up, and there's lots of legislation being tossed around, you know, about this, which dog breeds account for the most bites to humans and to children or maybe to other domestic animals? Again, we can start to pull that information. Um, and then there is a potential to look at the economic impacts of animal bites. So, if we are collecting information on how many animals are being confined, you know, that takes county resources. If there's a confinement facility, a kennel, or something like that, we can look at that and, and hopefully get some more money for these things. Um, and then also PEP, how much, how much of an economic burden is that for our state? Um, and then finally, you know, where are we going from here? Um, I mentioned that we did an evaluation of the training itself. We want to do um, a similar survey of user satisfaction now that the state has been using it for several months um, and we're hoping to complete that by the end of this year. Um, we still have some revisions to the module to improve user satisfaction and ease. We've identified some of those um, and I think some of them will come out of the survey as well. So we're continuing development on that and then we're hoping that this will serve as a model for other diseases that you know we work closely with environmental health. If you think about foodborne disease there's um, significant collaboration, you know, with EPI and environmental health there too. So this does have the potential to, to serve as a model for collaborating sort of in this One Health context on the other diseases. And I did want to acknowledge, um, I mentioned Tim Callahan from Environmental Health and Carl Sotabir is our technical lead for SINS. They were absolutely instrumental in doing this. I just happened to be the one up here talking to you today, um, but they have done exceptionally with this. CDC provided the funding for our travel and of course our district public health partners. We could not have done this without their support and willingness to take on what seemed to be a rather large change, but for most people, um, I think has been a good change. <laughs>